Hello, everyone. A few notes. First, I'm not a Chelsea fan. I'm an Arsenal fan. Okay. I'm. This is a gift that I got in like 2009 or 2010. It was super big for me back then. It fits me now, and it's a nice enough shirt that I wear it. So don't kill me. That's the first thing I'm gonna say. The second thing that I'm gonna say is I'm here joined by Elephant Philosophy. So we're we're super excited for that. EP, thanks for coming on. Yeah, I would just like to say he's an Arsenal fan, but he's an Arsenal fan without pride, so he's wearing a Chelsea shirt or <laughs> that is, because uh, you can never do that, man. Um, se- second point, uh, yeah, I'm still alive, actually. I'm still alive and kicking, and uh, I do take some kind of interest in the love of your religion still, so be assured of that. So, today we are covering ontological arguments their history, de- tracing them through uh, today, and potentially covering, uh, at the end of the discussion, maybe contemporary moves in the modal ontological argument literature. But I think we're going to be starting with Anselm. So, um, yeah, EP, how about you just, you know, start for us? How about you just take us where you want to go, and uh, I think you want to trace us through that the history of ontological arguments. So in Anselm's arguments, and there are two ontological arguments, let us just be sure of that, because there are two distinct arguments, and uh, the first one is probably not sound. We could argue about the second one. Uh, the second one is to be taken seriously. The first one really isn't that much. Um, but that's not the point. Formulations of arguments, arguments and the syllogistic forms are always interesting, but they're not really that important. What is important about St. Anselm is that he really came to grips, uh, to grips with um, the main form that all kind of ontological arguments will necessarily have to take. They will have to be based on the metaphysical idea of a necessary being that has some kind of metaphysical necessity intrinsic to it. I know that the early church fathers, as far as I understand them, were kind of dancing around the idea of metaphysical necessity, but they never formulated it in a way that is straightforward, um, analytically precise and intelligible in the way that St. Anselm did. Um, Now, historically speaking, there is some discussion about whether St. Anselm was actually the one who kind of came up with the idea in this kind of way. As far as I remember it, there were um, rumors about there being theological circles that he emerged from prior to him becoming um, the Archbishop of Canterbury. So in reality, somebody else might be the originator of this kind of precise thinking about metaphysical necessity, but he um, definitely is the one who put pen to paper and kind of um, came up with this idea of a metaphysically necessary being, a being that due to its nature could not, not exist. He tried to kind of prove that all kind of concrete reality has to be grounded fundamentally by this kind of entity. This is really St. Anselm's uh, great, great contribution to philosophy, and it is one of the more important thoughts in the history of thought generally. So if we want to really have an understanding of um, metaphysical reality in this sense, um, we should probably be thinking about metaphysical necessity as the grounding of reality in, in this kind of way, right? That reminds me, so two two notes. The first note is that I I should have said this at the beginning, but this is this was a completely impromptu discussion for the audience. Like we just decided on a whim to have this conversation and to so we didn't prepare at all. But we're gonna have fun because we have prepared studying for years in philosophy of religion and whatnot, and we both are really interested in ontological arguments. So I will say that. The second thing that I want to say is that that's interesting how you kind of trace it back to Anselm being, the, at least in print, the progenitor of seeing the centrality of necessity and uh, the kind of modal concept and, and relating it to um, arguments for God's existence. How is that embodied in what he writes? Can you can you just take us through that? Like, how does Anselm capture this? Is it in his idea of God's not being able to be conceived not to exist? Or like, c- can you just take us through this? Like, how did Anselm like kind of hit the nail on the head with respect to modality. First, I want to make sure that I'm not an authority on the early church fathers, but I <laughs> yeah. writing, so I know that the um, the idea of something that actually grounds reality is sort of imminent in the text of the the early church fathers. It's just 
isn't very clearly articulated in some sense because they are very much concerned about the greatness of a being and its wonderful immaculate attributes. They're not interested in reality as a whole. And this is kind of what I, what I find in St. Anselm is that St. Anselm thinks about the way reality as a whole could have been, right? And that is sort of the um, a complete groundwork of what metaphysical necessity as a concept actually is, as, as I understand it. He is the first to actually think about a maximal set. He isn't explicit about this, but he thinks about a maximal set of propositions and how the word could be structured according to this maximal set, infinite as it may be. If you actually look at a text and look at his thoughts, they are not ripe or mature like that, but he certainly has the right idea in his mind, even mm -hmm. if he lacks the modern tools to express what he's really thinking about. And that, I think, is St. Anselm's main contribution. So people argue about whether his formulations of the ontological arguments are sound. They're probably not sound. Even if they are sound in the end, rational disagreement is always possible with these two arguments. Um, but that's not the point. I, I know that we are trying to trace the sort of development of ontological arguments throughout history, but it's probably also worth, you know, just camping out on his two arguments. So, I mean, like Anselm's, I mean, at least his first, again, for the audience, we're doing this off the top of our heads, but um, so firstly, he says, like, hey, we have this idea of the greatest conceivable being or that than which none greater can be conceived. So I'm just going to label that the greatest conceivable being. And so he says, whatever is understood exists in the understanding. And so like even a non-theist, even someone who doesn't believe in the greatest conceivable being, they can at least understand like that concept. They can understand what a greatest conceivable being is. And since what is understood exists in the understanding, it follows that a greatest conceivable being exists in the understanding. Now we have to ask, well, does it exist in the understanding alone, like just in our minds alone, or does it also exist in extra mental mind independent reality? And the idea is that, well, if the being existed in both mind independent reality and in the understanding, well, then it would be better than if it just existed in the mind. I mean, th there's some sense in which, yeah, if this being really existed out in reality, surely it would be better than if it solely existed in the mind. And so if we suppose that it solely exists in the mind, well, then we can actually conceive of a better being, namely one that is qualitatively identical, but that also exists in reality, both in the mind and reality. And so if it only exists in the mind, we could conceive of a greater being, but that's absurd, right? This is the greatest conceivable being. So you can't conceive of a being that's greater, but yet we just concluded that we can conceive of a being that's greater. And so we get a contradiction from the supposition that it exists solely in the understanding in which case it must exist both in the understanding and in reality, in extra mental reality. Uh, and so to say that the greatest conceivable being exists in extra mental reality just is to say that, um, you know, the greatest conceivable being exists out there independently of us. And so um, that's basically his conclusion. And that's, you know, that's God. So he, the argument is that God exists. I mean, I have a lot of criticisms, but <laughs> I'll turn it over to you. Where do you want to start in terms of assessing this argument? And, you know, you can comment on my formulation. No, no, the first is just, um is um, the concept of greatest conceivable being even a sound one in the sense that is there a largest natural number, right? Mm -hmm. Like, can we imagine some greater being just by thinking of quantifiability of some kind of property, right? Um, that that would be, and then that, that's, I mean, there were certainly very, I think even Bertrand Russell was one of the people who said that, um, they can always imagine a greater being. I think that if we talk about maxed out properties, if we're thinking about the normal or the ordinary definitions of something like omnipotence, being able to do all logically possible tasks, and I know this is a very naive definition of omnipotence. Yeah. It's very messy and complicated, but if we think about omniscience, like knowing the truth values of all true propositions, of all propositions, um, this would be maxed out and wouldn't allow for any kind of enhancement, right? So we would have basically a uh, kind of maxed out property that couldn't be greater just in principle, conceptually, right? So we, if we talk about that, then we would be, at least if we talk in the space of these kinds of properties, we would be able to talk about the greatest conceivable being. But axiology, in that sense, is also very complicated. There's also the axiological concern about comparison between existence and non-existence, which is yeah. another 
very, very complicated <laughs> topic. I think that Alexander Proust made a very, very potent criticism of this kind of Yeah, populism. that's probably my favorite it, criticism. It is, Sorry, I get excited with this one. I mean, it, Proust points out that it just doesn't make any sense to talk about like the greatness of a non-existent thing, um, except, right, except hypothetically, right, as the greatness like it would have were it to exist. So uh, when we compare the greatness of things like, um, you know, Spider-Man and Superman, you know, um, we basically mean like if Superman were to exist, well, then he would be greater than Spider-Man would be if Spider-Man existed. And to exist is to exist in, in reality. But in that case, if that's what we do when we're comparing the greatness of things, then the crucial claim in Anselm's argument that it's greater for something to exist in both mind and reality than just in the mind, that actually comes out false. Because in the hypothetical way, we're actually comparing the greatness of the thing that exists in the mind, that we're comparing the greatness that that thing would have were it to exist in experimental reality with the same being that exists in experimental reality. So it's not greater, actually, um, for it to exist in experimental reality, because it's the same greatness. A really existing Aragon is uh, just as great a swordsman as a non-existing Aragon, because we hypothetically assume that a non-existing Aragon is existing as a swordsman, right? Mm -hmm. It's silly in this sense. If we try to understand it from a historical perspective, what he is actually trying to say he he's talking about greatness as a universal property across things that exist and do not exist we we're talking about hypothetical greatness but in a kind of different sense than he could kind of put down um linguistically we're talking about greatness as some kind of abstraction of existing things and we we can just fill in the blankets there in this sense so uh, i'm not um I'm, I'm fairly convinced that this argument doesn't work in this sense and i think Proust nailed it but it wasn't actually um as far as i remember this is not Proust's take on the argument he's just recalling it but it's it's very convincing to say mm -hmm. that it's not the way to deal with greatness greatness is in some sense a hypothetical property of things if they were to exist so far we've leveled roughly two or so criticisms i mean first one well, you asked is there such a thing as as the greatest conceivable being i mean could we always conceive of something greater and the second one that we leveled was well Proust's hypothetical greatness response and the greatness of non-existent things only being hypothetical uh on that first one uh i kind of want to see if we can push back a little bit like yeah omniscience for instance definitely maxes out but what about the extrinsic properties of this thing? Like, is a being greater if it makes a greater world? And then presumably that would just get us into the, the conversation about, like, surely or we can conceive of infinitely greater worlds, right? And if we can conceive of infinitely greater worlds, well, then to the extent that a being is greater if it makes a better world, well, then actually there won't be a greatest conceivable being because there are infinitely many ascending greater worlds. I wonder what you think about that. I thought you would make a distinction between, like, the intrinsic properties of the thing and the extrinsic properties of the thing and like okay well we only mean that the intrinsic properties of the thing which are such that they are the greatest conceivable intrinsic properties that anything could have and i think you might be able to run the argument with that alone but then then you actually might not be able to get to like certain great making extrinsic properties like um independence even omniscience is an extrinsic uh well at least knowledge is is partly extrinsic right it's dependent on the facts themselves if they were to restrict their argument solely to the intrinsic great making properties well then you might not actually deliver your desired conclusion because lots of like perfections that we want to say of god you won't be able to deliver because such but those perfections are indeed extrinsic like independence and like aseity and knowledge and other sorts of things uh, but, but once you say that we actually can include these extrinsic sorts of properties. Well, then why can't we say that making a better world is such a being is better to the extent that it makes a better world, in which case there won't be a greatest conceivable being because there's no greatest conceivable world. You can always add one more happy person. That's an interesting dilemma. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, this kind of weird who actually just speculated in a, um, in a syllogist form that there may be a best of all possible worlds, but hardly anybody believes that. And even of those people, hardly anybody believes that this is actually the best yeah. possible. 
if we're just being realistically, this is not the best of all possible worlds. So d does this relate to intrinsic properties? Is just, or is it just a, a problem of externality? It's probably not. And this is a very, very complicated um, discussion. This is actually one of the arguments against theism that I could possibly think of, because um, if there is an infinite array of worlds, one uh, at least where for every possible world, there's at least one better um, possible world, this actually makes God into a less than what I always thought rational agent. Because if you have infinite uh, possibilities, how do you choose one? A perfectly rational being is very hard pressed to choose from an infinite array of possibilities where for every possibility there is an infinite array better ones. That is actually, I think, a defeat of a perfect rationality. So this gets very, very complicated. If rationality is concerned, then this kind of choice of which word to create becomes a very intrinsic choice. It's a very intrinsic property because it actually relates to the potential mental states, desires, yeah. and else have you of this kind of being, right? And mm -hmm. if you even think of this being as this kind of a timeless entity, a changeless entity, then it hardly becomes a question that this is a kind of intrinsic property of this kind of being, which word it creates because it kind of stands in an internal, unchanging relation to its creation. So uh, very complicated questions. We cannot unzip this. I think that the distinction between in intrinsicality and extrinsicality becomes very, very blurry. And it takes a very, very uh, smart person to even make some kind of central distinction between these concepts. So I think we can set that first worry aside. Like, is there a greatest conceivable being? And, you know, because we're getting into weeds, <laughs> a lot of weeds right now. So we, we leveled two worries so far to Anselm's first ontological argument. I kind of want to level maybe one or two more just to give the audience a sense so like one of them is that uh, the argument seems to require what's called ontological pluralism. And uh, a lot of my a lot of people in my audience will have seen my video with Dr. Trenton Merricks, where we discuss ontological pluralism and ontological monism. And, and we argue for ontological monism in there. Ontological pluralism says that there are different ways to be. There are different ways to exist. There are different ways of being or modes of existence. We're not we're not. That's not just saying that there, there are different kinds of things. I think everyone agrees with that, except for like, you know, Parmenides and, and some people, um, some, cr some crazy people. But we're not just saying that there are different kinds of things. And we're not just saying that there are different like properties and so on. They're actually saying that there are different like kinds of existence or different types of existence, like different ways of being. And I, I actually think that Anselm's ontological argument is probably going to require pluralism, according to which there are different ways to exist, like actually different existences, as it were. So, for instance, his argument does make a distinction, right, between existence in reality, so that's existence in re, or esse in re, uh, versus existence in the understanding, right, uh, like esse in solo intellectu. Those are two different ways that something could exist. It could, like, exist in a way that's in the understanding, and somehow it could also exist in the way that's in reality. I mean, it's hard to even understand like what this amounts to. Uh, but but secondly, that does seem to require that there are different ways of being. There's one way of being, namely existing in the understanding, and there's another way of being, namely existing in reality. And these are different ways of being. But then that requires pluralism, and there are significant challenges to pluralism. It's sort of like thinking about a golden mountain. Does the golden mountain exist by being thought of? It's it's <laughs> can't get to modern on this because if you're the referent of thought does that actually entail that you exist is this a kind of prerequisite for existence it's a very complicated thing um existing in the understanding is maybe a um a not very precise phrasing maybe we kind of let astray that's maybe not what he thinks so mm. as a strictly speak yeah i mean what is it to say that so it's not just like the concept of God exists in my understanding. It's God exists in my understanding. I'm like, what? God, God's in my, I don't, <laughs> okay, this is just revealing that I need to study probably more about like Anselm scholarship. I always get the understanding that Anselm wants to put this into the realm of non-existence, right? Yeah, just no, that's the Minoanian worry. Yeah, there, so in that's. The wrong terminology and he's kind of sloppy about it because he doesn't have the kind of modern understanding of philosophy of language. And, and basic metaphysics, philosophy of mind, and 
philosophy of I, I don't know intentionality reference and stuff so it, he kind of formulates sloppily what he mm -hmm. means is basically i think really non-existence right that actually gets into one of tyron goldschmidt's criticisms of it in tyron's recent ontological argument book like he argues i think that it requires something like minonianism and uh well minonianism is false there are no non-existent things sorry <laughs> well, that, i know that's the weirdest terrains of philosophy that yeah i would never get my head wrapped around but <laughs> yeah it's about reference and you can't reference non-existing things so there is a kind of having being and existing and these are two distinct things one of the weirdest philosophers ever that's sort of like three or so different well sort of we, we talked about is there a greatest conceivable being secondly we went over Proust's hypothetical greatness problem third we went over um the pluralism about being and that one was so, sort of also my knowingism and i guess um i kind of just want to raise one more and and that's sort of the aquinas one that i was hinting at earlier but it's it's sort of oppie's as well so oppie makes a distinction between like existence is being encoded in a concept so uh, that's just to say that like part of the definition of the concept you can tease out from the definition or perhaps it's explicitly encoded in there uh, that existence is in there so for instance uh, the smallest really existent martian right that has existence encoded in it but like we can still think about the smallest really existent martian and understand that what it is to be that thing is to exist while still denying existence of that thing because that's a distinction between existence being encoded in the concept versus attributing existence to the 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 subject like uh, the smallest really existent martian and then going on to say that it actually exists in reality um so he makes a distinction oppie and it again he's following in the footsteps of even people like aquinas i i would argue i think that oppie's right that anselm's argument only gets us to existence is being encoded in the concept of god like what it is to be god is to exist but it's a further question right like similar to how what it is to be a really smallest really existent martian is to exist but there's a separate question as to whether or not there is the smallest really existent martian and similarly it's a separate question as to whether or not there is a god we can appear into the mind of saint Anselm, right uh, i have the suspicion that if he uh, i mean when he talks about only existing in the mind he really means non-existing only as a figment of imagination and uh, if we take this phrase too literally as some kind of existence, uh, if there's a dual duality of existence as a mental reality or something, I think we're getting Anselm wrong. Mm, that's interesting. Okay, so I think that's enough for Anselm's first argument. We raised like four or five criticisms of it, and um, we can probably move on. Do you want to move on to his second argument? We can conceive, or oh, if there's a possibility of a being that cannot not exist, like there is some kind of modern modal understanding in it, right? Um, wh what is, um, I, I don't know the exact uh, um, um, statistic formulation, but I understand Anselm's second argument as the idea of, let us think conceptually about a being that is such that it could not not exist. Let us just think about it. And if we can coherently think about it, if reality really could be in a you know thinking about possibility in a way like that if such a being could exist surely it does exist that is very close to modern formulations of s5 because he really thinks about what it entails to even be able to conceive of such a being now he's not very far advanced but what he actually thinks about is just metaphysical necessity and he he is not that far away from some kind of it's possible that it's necessary that right mm -hmm. yeah so you're thinking sort of that he's almost making a move from well i guess you could read it in two ways maybe one way is a move from conceivability to possibility but another way is just to read him as when he says that something is conceivable he kind of just means that like, listen it's possible so those are i guess two ways you could i'm wondering yes yeah, understanding of the distinction between conceivability and possibility that's that's totally sure for him it's if he would now talk to Anselm, conceivability and possibility would probably be the same thing for him mm. as the, the way I read of him he thinks and there is a sort of confusion about him about mental reality if he can kind of conceive of it that's a possibility 
So he's completely muddled in that point. If we draw back to the first argument, um, but he can understand that if reality, if reality admits for a being that could not, not exist, then it truly exists. I think in some kind of sense, in his intuitive understanding, he kind of gets that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not sure if we have much to say by way of criticisms, just because this is going to be similar to the modal ontological argument when we get later on. I mean, you know, there's there are going to be these symmetry problems where it seems as though we can conceive of a world in which the greatest conceivable being doesn't exist, say, or it seems as though we can conceive of a world in which God doesn't exist, or we can at least conceive of some state of affairs which is such that were that state of affairs to obtain, that would be incompatible with God, like, let's say, super duper gratuitous evil or, or what have you. So that's that would probably be my my worry. Well, two worries. One of them is the symmetry problem. The second one would just be that conceivability doesn't imply possibility. And uh, I think it's a not even that good of a guide to possibility. Uh, I don't think it's a zero. I don't think it's a, an utterly useless guide. I just think it's really, really defeasible. So, right. I mean, what what are your sort of criticisms of, of this second argument? Um, yeah, I mean, conceivability is a weak, as I said, it's a weak induction for a possibility. And we're not... I mean, given the fact that conceivability is sort of a psychological, it's a mental state that yeah. kind of is, is very easily defeasible. So how strong a guide is it to real metaphysical possibility? It's debatable. People will be, some people will be pretty sure if I can sort of imagine or conceive of something. Uh, if I don't find any internal contradiction in it, uh, it's probably possible. Other people just find that a little bit ridiculous. Up. Yeah. <laughs> now, there's the second question. If uh, we are not able to identify some kind of contradiction, um, well, how good are we at uh, finding contradictions in concepts? Um, well, maybe not that good at all because uh, concepts are very complicated and their entailments and the entailments of their entailments and then they might stand in conflict to other things we don't know. We're not very good at this. We couldn't be because we're very limited in scope in this area. So um, mm -hmm. take conceivability as being too strong. But I still think we should trust our, our mental faculties a little bit. So it's some kind of evidence. But talking about evidence and some kind of Bayesian formulation of evidence in these kinds of environments is very, very shaky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well... We covered Anselm's two arguments, and I think now we can probably move on uh, to the next person in our historical tour. Uh, for you, is that going to uh, is that going to be Spinoza or Descartes? Which one do you want to take first? I would start with Descartes. Let me first say I think Descartes' ontological argument is fundamentally flawed and just um, just doesn't work. Um, Descartes perceives as God as um, a being that has all the perfections. And since having all the perfections means having existence, because to him existence is a perfection, means having existence. And uh, yeah, since uh, existence is a perfection, it has to be instantiated in reality in some sense. And therefore, since existence is a perfection, there can be a being that instantiated God exists. Um, if you care to read Howard Sobel's Logic and Theism, you will surely be very, very uh, well informed about the fallacy of this, which simply means that if um, conceptually there exists a being that has all the perfections, just doesn't mean that in reality there is a being that has all the perfections. And this is the clearest way we can formulate this. Mm -hmm. um, Art conceptually means having all the perfections, but that doesn't tell you if there exists a being that actually exemplifies these perfections. And Howard Sobel has this marvelously rigorous way of um, showing how every kind of formulation, even, even the most charitable ones, commit this kind of fallacy that just uh, because um, definitionally, and that's why it's sometimes called the definitional ontological arguments, just defining a being as having all kinds of perfections doesn't get you to the fact that this kind of being actually exists. Mm -hmm. And uh, Immanuel Kant actually, a lot of people think Immanuel Kant criticizes St. Anselm's ontological argument when he says that um, existence is not a predicate, right? This is a very common phrase. He isn't actually. 
He's not talking about St. Anselm. He is talking about Descartes because what he is trying to say is that's a different kind of criticism, but Kant of Immanuel Kant, of course, says that um, it, it isn't exactly clear that existence itself is a perfection. Rather, existence is sort of the, the fundament of having perfections or any kind of properties in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Thomas Sobel has a different kind of criticism. Even if existence is a perfection, that doesn't mean that there is actually an entity that exemplifies this kind of perfection. And uh, yeah, so I think that, um, and even if existence is a perfection, um, Descartes' argument is so modeled on there being a supremely perfect being that exemplifies all the perfections in order to be God. He doesn't show um, any kind of compatibility of all perfections. So there are so many lines of attacking, uh, of attacking this kind of argument that I think it completely falls to pieces. As I learned the, the simplest version of it, you know, it just goes something like premise one, a perfect being has every perfection. Premise two, uh, existence is a perfection <laughs> conclusion. Therefore, a perfect being has existence, which just is to say that a perfect being exists. Now, uh, as Sobel and a bunch of others point out, I guess I should say at this juncture, Sobel, the, the book that we're talking about is Logic and Theism. We both highly recommend that everyone pick up that book and read it. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, but uh, the criticism of this argument, uh, just to kind of reiterate what EP said, is just that first premise is ambiguous. When, when we say that a perfect being has every perfection, that's ambiguous. We could be saying that there is an X such that X is a perfect being, and X and for any Y, if Y is a perfection, then X has Y. We could be saying that, but if we're saying that, then we're kind of quite overtly begging the question. We're saying there exists an X such that X is a perfect being. <laughs> that, that's, that's what we're saying. <laughs> so we're rather overtly begging the question. We're, we're literally saying there exists a perfect being, and that's what we're trying to establish. Uh, so we can't be saying that. But in that case, if we don't go with that existential formulation, say that there is an X such that X is a perfect being and X has every perfection or, or whatever, then all we're saying is that, hey, if there's a perfect being, then that perfect being has every perfection. But then your conclusion is just that if a perfect being exists, then a perfect being exists. And and that's obviously rather trivial. Uh, and yeah, no, that doesn't get you a perfect being in existence. Descartes certainly glosses over the real issue is necessary existence, not existence as a perfection, right? So, for example, if now a, perf uh, um, a perfect being pops into existence, right, has every perfection, and then next moment ceases to exist, right? That would have been God, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't tell you that God exists. He can stop to exist any at any time. He loses that perfection, doesn't exist anymore. Oh, there's no perfect being anymore. So from that, we cannot deduce that it exists now. It could just pop into existence and go out of existence. It exists, it truly has every perfection because it exists and has all the other perfections. That doesn't tell us that it exists now because obviously it can go out of existence. Yeah. So Descartes was in that absence really ignorant of what St. Anselm had already established, right? Mm -hmm. So. The argument's uninteresting from that perspective. And I did just want to like call the audience's attention to, with respect to that that first premise, where every perfect or not not every a perfect being has every perfection. To see how that's ambiguous, consider if I said um, a unicorn has has horns, right? That's that's kind of that's ambiguous. It's ambiguous between saying that hey, there is a unicorn and that unicorn has horns. Like a unicorn has horns. Like there's some unicorn that has horns. Uh, that's the that's the horn of the yeah. dilemma. To, to, to be to make a pun, that's the horn of the dilemma where, uh, you know, you're saying there is an X such that X is a perfect being. But on the other horn of the dilemma, right, you, all we're saying is that if there is a unicorn, then it has a horn. Like, it's just part of the definition of a unicorn, but we're not saying that there are unicorns. We're just saying if there is a unicorn, then it has horns. On that horn of the dilemma, then you're saying if there's a perfect being, then it has existence, that perfection. Uh, and that's where you get the triviality. So it's either question begging or trivial. That's basically the the 
the, the problem with it. So let's move on to Leibniz. Um, and this is where we get the idea of compossibility. And this is a, a big move. This is a big step. So I'll turn it over to you. Leibniz was the one who pointed out to Spinoza, actually, that his um, ontological argument cannot really be sound in this sense if he doesn't prove the compossibility of great making properties or that would be actually exemplified by this infinite substance. That's a big problem of all ontological arguments. If you want to make um, a perfect being approach and you want to define the perfect being as having all perfections, apart from the question of what all perfections are, is the question is how can you actually prove that all com uh, perfections can exist alongside each other in one single being, right? For example, you could have um, the perfection of being brave in the face of great uncertainty, right? But um, that would be something that seems very perfect, right? But if you are omniscient, you cannot face great uncertainty. So these are, seem to be two perfections that are not compossible. They cannot exist in one substance or one being at the same time. So that's a, a real um, that's a real obstacle for um, ontological arguments to actually prove that all what is perfect about a being can exist in said one being and one being alone. So Leibniz pointed out this problem for other ontological arguments and from what I understand he offers a kind of progenitor Godelian ontological argument at least that's what I've been like told. Uh, I haven't actually read the relevant portions of Leibniz to be able to confirm this. Are you aware of, of a kind of progenitor Godelian style ontological argument where he argues for their compossibility? I'm not sure if it's actually known what he thought, but he of course thought he had a proof of the compossibility of all perfection. So um, does he have an argument? Yeah, I think there is some argument. I don't actually remember what it was. It's probably not very convincing, but of course it, it was Leibniz. He had a proof of everything, right? Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so I, anyway, that's that was the big insight from from Leibniz, at least that, that you and I take. And so I think we could probably move on to uh, the next thinker in our list, which we don't have a list. We're doing this off the top of our heads. So like um, maybe we can move into the 20th century. So, you know, we could start getting into to Gödel and um, even potentially Malcolm and Plantinga. Yeah, we, we can do Gödel. I mean, Gödel's ontological argument is very a treat. Right. He, of course, I mean, Kurt Gödel was a brilliant logician, uh, just a mastermind, but um, and he, he thought a long time about his ontological argument, and uh, except for some very, very modern, um, there are some flaws uh, pertaining to the empty property, right, which is this very modern uh, thing that he kind of, his, his argument is sound in the sense if you exclude exclude the empty property, which is sometimes in the modern literature called self different So uh, a thing can be different from itself if you take all its properties and then you equate it with itself, just add the empty property. And this is a modern logical trickery that kind of is valid and uh, reasonable, but wasn't known to Gödel. That is actually one of the um, let's discard it from serious discussion. There is no such thing as an empty property, but strictly following from the axioms of third order logic, um, there could be an empty property. And it is found that modern modern um, modern validity checkers like um, computational algorithms or something, they find out that uh, there is a problem with this. It doesn't matter. Um, Good Gödel's formulation is actually a very trickery one. Um, he thinks that he has found a proof of um, of the um, compatibility of all perfections. If he thinks that perfections uh, are closed on an entailment, right? So if you take a set of perfections and what they entail is another perfection, right? And then you say, okay, so if you have this whole set, Imagine it is all the perfections, but they sort of entail a non-perfection, right? Uh, if that is not if that is not possible, then you can sort of close it down. Then all other perfections also cannot entail a non-perfection, and then you you have a very easy proof that all perfections entail 
only perfection. So as long as they're closed on an entailment, uh, you kind of get, and it's a sort of intuitive that if something is a perfection, it can only entail something other than, uh, it can not entail anything other than perfection, right? Yeah, I mean, as I see it, there are a few important working parts here. One of them is the closure of perfection under entailment. So perfections, it, minimally, perfections do not entail imperfections. So that's the minimal understanding that perfections don't entail imperfections. Secondly, uh, another working part is that um, the property of being God or being a perfect being or being a necessarily existent perfect being, that is itself a perfection. Or at least that all of the properties which are such that they're individually necessary and jointly sufficient for that being to exist. Those are each and every one of them, they're all perfections. So that's another working part. And then the third working part is that I do think you're probably going to need, you're probably gonna need S5 as well as necessary existence being among these perfections that, that could be instantiated along with the other ones. So I think those are the working parts yeah. because otherwise you only get that they're compossible. You're only gonna be able to get that there's possibly a being with all the perfections. Uh, and so you're gonna need to add S5, I think. Um, so those are the three working parts as I see it. And that kind of gives you three different avenues or gives the non-theist three different avenues to, to criticize. Yes, and the author goes off, it's like having a property of having a property is just having this property. So having the property of exemplifying a perfection is just exemplifying a perfection. Mm -hmm. That is, so you don't max out these properties till affinity and never get, um, that's also important for the groups. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Having the property of being perfect just means being perfect, right? That's also something. Uh, and exactly. uh, yes, you need five um, i don't don't think he actually act ever characterizes this as the modal axiom as five or anything like he just says that necessary if you if it's possible for you to have necessary existence you exist right that's mm -hmm. uh, the simple thing that he does and you know that's uh, that's pretty much his proof first of all if we talk criticism it's not entirely clear that um, this kind of compatibility is even possible because it's not even clear that um, perfections uh, sort of are closed under entailment. It's the same kind of example that I just talked about being so, it's a, a planting of brokenness up actually. Um, being, being sort of brave in the, in the face of great uncertainty is a, if, if that can be seen as a perfection and omniscience can be seen as a perfection, these are not compatible. Mm -hmm. And then it actually seem that being omniscient would actually mean that perfections are not closed on entailment because bravery as a property uh, would not be something accessible or exemplifiable by God. How could God be brave, right? Yeah, that's definitely one potential difficulty for the closure thesis. I mean, I'd imagine that he'd say something like that's a, a an impure perfection, right? So we could distinguish between pure perfections and impure perfections. Maybe an impure perfection is like it's sort of like a complex property where some of its parts entail limitation and imperfection, like lacking knowledge, whereas other parts of that perfection entail, don't entail that kind of imperfection. The parts of bravery that don't entail that would be like having the power to uh, engage in the relevant activities. But but maybe there is, you know, so what, what do you think about that? What do you think about that that response where Actually, that's just an impure perfection, and we can disentangle the aspects of that, some of which are, yeah, sure, some of which are imperfections, but there's still some root core that is a pure perfection that God actually could have, like maybe the relevant power. Yeah, I agree with that. We can also talk about intrinsicality and extrinsicality. Um, intrinsically, God can be brave as he wants to be, but just extrinsically, it's true that he will never face uh, circumstances where there are uh, where he is uh, subject to imperfect information or something, right? So yeah. if God were circumstances where he didn't know everything, right, even per impossibilum, right, he would be perfectly brave. It's just that this will never happen. So mm -hmm. intrinsically, he is brave, but if we took the if we take uh, into account the extrinsic aspect, it's never going to happen that he is in circumstances where he could actually exemplify bravery in the way that we understand it. I mean, let me just trace out two potential difficulties that I have with this Godelian ontological argument. Then we'll move on to planning it, and then we'll we'll close this out. So basically, we have these two 
or at least two important principles, right? The first one was per the closure principle that perfections don't entail imperfections. And the second principle was that the property or, yeah, roughly the property of being a necessarily existent perfect being is itself uh, a perfection. Now, I think that um, any non-theist who accepts one of those is just going to be well within their epistemic rights of just rejecting the other one flat out, right? Suppose we accept that perfections don't entail imperfections. Maybe it's just like part of the definition of perfection, or maybe that's constitutive of it. Well, then the non-theist, or let, let's just go with the atheist. The atheist is not going to say that the property being a necessarily existent perfect being is a perfection, because precisely because they think that that property is not possibly exemplified, right? We already know from the modal ontological argument that if God possibly exists, in which case if this property is possibly exemplified, well, then it's actually exemplified, then God actually exists. And so the atheist already thinks that, th that God is impossible and that this property is not possibly exemplified. It is not possible. But we know from the principle of explosion that uh, if something is impossible, well, then it entails everything. So like the possession of the pro the impossibly instantiated property being a necessarily existent perfect being, that would entail possessing all different sorts of imperfections because we have a necessarily false antecedent. And so you can actually get that this property does entail a whole host of imperfections, in which case it's not a perfection per the first premise. So it just falls out of the atheist's commitments that uh, the property being a necessarily existent perfect being is not a perfection, which is required for the Godelian ontological item to go through. That's assuming, that's assuming that we grant that first premise that perfections don't entail imperfections. But, I mean, let's say the atheist wants to go the other way. Maybe they think that, yeah, I mean, obviously the property being a necessarily existent perfect being, obviously that's a perfection. Like, they might say that. But then, because we already know that the atheist, and the atheist already knows this if they are pay attention to their commitments, because they already know that that property is not possibly exemplified, they are ipso facto committed to the falsity of premise one. It's just false that perfections don't entail imperfections, precisely because, number one, the property of being a necessarily existent perfect being is it, that's not possible. And yet it's a perfection and impossible things entail literally everything. And so in that case, we have a perfection entailing imperfections. Right. So I just I don't think that the atheist should be convinced at all by the Godelian ontological argument just because it just falls out of the commit their commitments that at least one of these premises is just flatly wrong. And for good reason. I mean, like, it, this isn't like cheating or anything. This is just falls out of their own position, right? To assert, so, to assert both of these uh, premises is just to assert no, the no, falsity the, of atheism. An atheist can also just be a skeptic about the concept of perfection itself, right? That's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what does it actually mean to be perfect in regard to something? Um, I think that if you pose this question to the theist, he's going to have a lot of explaining to do what it actually means to be perfect in regard to something. And if this is a real concept or if this is some kind of, yeah, spooky mind trick or something. <laughs> I mean, yeah, are there perfections? What does it mean to be perfect? We talked about maxed up properties, right? Uh, it's kind of intuitive that maxed up properties exemplify perfections, but um, are there maxed up properties? Well, arguably there are, arguably there aren't, and if there really aren't, you're going to have a hard time convincing anybody that the um, concept of perfection actually refers to something real. That's interesting. So I think we could probably just close off now with um, a brief discussion of, of planning this modal ontological argument. So maybe I'll just turn it over to you to uh, to kind of spell it out. We probably only have five, six minutes left. Yes, so, so Plantinger is not interested in a sound, uh, is not interested in a sound argument. He just thinks that he wants to present something that is rationally acceptable to himself, basically, right? That's most of what Plantinger does. Um, it is just a basically riff of an S five that it's possible that there exists a maximally great being and uh, via S5 he get to the existence of such a being, right? He had his quarrels with Hawthorne where um, they distinguish between maximally excellent being which has all the great making properties in one specific possible world and a maximally being which kind of exemplifies these properties in every possible world. 
And they had some very technical disputes about this, which are kind of interesting to certain people like me, but maybe not to everybody. The idea is uh, just basically you can say that it's possible that there exists a maximally great being. Maximally great being is sort of conceptually a uh, necessary existent being. And if it's possible that there exists a max- uh, necessary existent being, then it exists. And uh, if it exists, of course, it exists in the actual world and so on and so forth, right? Um, they call it the triumphant or victorious ontological argument where it's very simple and just relies on a very intuitive and basic model principle. But this actually gets you into very, I think, very helpful and very important, but also very controversial discussions about what it means to be intrinsically metaphysically necessary. Right? And you have criticisms of this. I have questions about this. So You were just pointing out different ways that some people might push back. I mean, uh, I'm sure my audience at this point is aware that, you know, there's the the symmetry problem, right? You know, possibly there's no perfect being or possibly there's no necessarily existent perfect being. I know heat planning, I calls it a maximally great being. Possibly there's no such being. It follows from S5 that there is no such being. And that's where you get into the symmetry breaker debate. And um, that's where a lot of the discussion is going on these days. And in fact, um, well, I had a, I know the audience is probably aware of this, but I had a discussion with Alex O'Connor or Cosmic Skeptic on capturing Christianity on one of a sym- one of the symmetry breakers that I myself have defended. But yeah, like you get into symmetry, there are certain worries for S5 that some people raise. I myself do think that S5 probably captures uh, metaphysical modality. Uh, so I'm not among the camp that disagrees with S5, but it should be at least be on the audience's radar that as with most things in philosophy, it's it's quite controversial, S5. I guess I'll turn it over to you for the final word. Um, if you want to comment on anything like overall the discussion or even this this planning as argument or uh, yeah, I'll just turn it over to you. Uh, let us just say that um, I regard ontological arguments as sort of um, maybe they're weak evidence for the existence of a necessary being, but that doesn't necessarily imply that there are any theistic commitments, right? Um, I regard the discussion about perfections as mainly misguided. So even if uh, ontological arguments can prove the existence of a necessary being, this has actually, to my mind, not any real strong theistic commitment. And uh, I am a big defender of the necessity of the concept of necessary existence, but that doesn't tell you that God exists or any of that sort. And generally, I find uh, ontological argument just interesting from a technical perspective. Yeah. Logical, philosophical, technical perspective. They are just fascinating exercises in thinking they are not necessarily a good guide to any kind of theological commitments. Well said. So uh, you can, EP, you can stick around for the after show. It's all show. fun. Yeah, <laughs> you, can, you can stick around for the after show, EP, but I'm going to say goodbye to the audience. Everyone, I hope you enjoyed that. If you enjoy this content, if you see value in the work that I do, uh, and if you want to help me pay off my student debt, you can consider supporting me on Patreon. Patreon. Much love for all my existing patrons. And uh, yeah, anyway, just consider doing it if you see value in the work that I do. And yeah, like I said, you'll help me pay off my student debt. So uh, much appreciated. Any amount, really. It's just like a cup of coffee a month, say. So um, if, if you want to have that that level. And you also get a lots of cool patron goodies. So anyway, what better way to end there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is The Majesty of Reason. And peace out. Peace out.